So good evening, everyone, and of course, good morning there. And um, so again, we will start as usual with a short mindful breathing exercise. Then you can generate a good intention by thinking, may our activities are coming together, listening, reflecting, contemplating, may all of this become cause and conditions to actualize all the lumbering <coughs> realization within our mind stream. And especially, um, realization of Guru devotions, the Guru Yoga, to be able to see the Guru and the Yidam, oneness in Sapreton. And the conventional ultimate bodhicitta within our mind stream, like Guru Avalokiteshvara. And having actualized all the lumbering realizations, may we be able to achieve the Guru Avalokiteshvara state of enlightenment. And to be able to liberate all sentient beings from all their suffering, cause of suffering, and lead them to fully enlightenment of Guru Avalokiteshvara state. To the founder that in the outcome standard destroy the one form beyond the four, destroy the completely perfect, fully awakened being, perfect knowledge and it would conduct. So God and all of the whole supreme guide of human being to be attained, teacher of God and human beings to you, the complete and fully awakened one. The in the outcome standard destroy the glorious convert, the subdue from the Shakya plane, I prostrate, make offering and go for life. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Vedic, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three people they bought homage to all who they respect, bowing with bodies, as many as all lands, atoms, and all expect, with the Supreme Faith, I pay homage. 
Do not commit any non-virtuous action. Perform only perfect virtuous actions. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha, a star, a visual, a realization, a flame of a line, an illusion, a drop of dew or bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud, sea condition, things as such. To this may, may sentient beings attain the rank of all things, subdue the four falls, and be delivered from some sort of ocean perturbed by the waves of Asian sickness and death. I prostrate to the Aryan triple gem, thus be that here at one time the Bakunas are dwelling in the mass of both mountain in the last year together with the great community of monks and great community of both sides. At that time the Bakunas observe in the concentration on category of phenomena called profound deception. Also at that time the both Sadhva, Mahasadhva, Aryan, Loki, Shora look upon the very practice of profound perfection and wisdom and beheld those five pegs also empty of inherent nature. And through the power of the Buddha, the Venerable Shari Buddha said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Ali Avalokishora, how should any son of the lineage strength who wish to practice the activity of profound perfection and wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Ali Avalokishora said this to the Venerable Shari Buddha, Shari Buddha, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wish to practice the activities of profound perfection and wisdom should look upon it like this correctly and repeatedly be holding the those five things, also in the empty of inherent nature. Form is empty emptiness, form empty is not other than form, form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling discrimination, composition, fact, and consciousness are empty, shari buddha, likewise, all phenomena, emptiness without other extreme, unproduced, unsustained, there's not without strength. No division, not fulfilled, shari buddha, therefore, in emptiness, and there's no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no composition of factors. No consciousness, no eye, no ear, no no, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no order, no taste, no object of touch and not phenomena. There is no eye element so on after and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, so on after and including no aging of death and no extinction of aging. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and death. There is no exaltation, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Shed Buddha, therefore, because there is no attainment, both set will rely on dual and perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond either, there is, there is the in point of nirvana, all the Buddhas who dwell in three times also manifest their completely awakened, unsurprised for perfect complete enlightenment, and will answer perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurprised mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that truly is a whole suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of perfect and wisdom declared, Tayata, Om, Radeka, Parak, Marasamka, Bodhi, Soha. Shari Buddha, the Bodhisattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commanded the Bodhisattva, Masatva, Arya, Lukishora, saying, Well said, well said. Son of the lineage, is it like that? It is like that one should practice a profound perfect and wisdom, just as you have indicated, even the Tadakatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shari Titi Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokishora, and those surrounding the entire alone world of the gods, human Asuras and Gandharvas, overjoyed and highly praised, that's spoken by the Bhagavan. So,
So we are still on uh, the practice of the Guru of, uh, of Logishoda. And um, oh, within that, uh, there's preliminary practice. And then there's uh, then the men um, visualizing magnetic field. And then once we have visualized magnetic field, then there is a civilian practice and mandala. And after that, then there is the Glance meditation on uh, lumbering, and within the, the glance uh, meditation on emptiness, then we uh, we finish up to um, the meditation on um, the path of middle scope, and uh, now we are on the uh, glance meditation on the uh, the practice of high scope. Mm. So it is in page number 11, and it's uh, after, yeah, um, so we, we are on the, so next, next glance meditation, meditation on um, Bodhisattva mind, okay. Um, Mm. So bestow on me your blessings to master the ocean of practice. Um, so the ocean of the practice here, meaning, you know, those different both set of us practices, you know, such as the practice of um, um, six perfections or uh, 10 perfections and for means of gathering disciples and benefiting them, you know, so, um, oceans of practice, so many of those both subtle practices. Um, and also to cultivate immediately the supreme enlightened motivation, so that is the Bodhisattva mind, the awakened mind. Um, and, um, and the way to, the, the way or the method to cultivate the Bodhisattva mind is through the meditations or contemplation or reflecting on the you know, the kindness of mother sentient beings um, and um, seeing their sufferings and through that and cultivating, uh, you know, unbearable compassion and desire to free them from all this suffering and to lead them to the enlightenment and for that, the wish to achieve enlightenment. And so that's where by reflecting on the predicaments of all mother sentient beings who have nourished me with the kindness from the beginningless time. You know. So by reflecting, contemplating, you know, how all mother sentient, how all sentient beings had in our mothers many times, not just one time, many times in the past. Um, they have been our mothers, most kind mothers, countless time as human beings. They all have been our most kind mother, countless time as a bird, countless time as a dog, countless time as a all different form of life. You know, um, so not only just one rebirth or only in one realms or one specific, but they have been kind in many times in many different, countless times in, in all different. And um, so, so by recognizing that all sentient beings are our, our kind mother, not only one time, many, many times, you know, many, many times, um, 
countless times in each of different uh, form of lives, you know, and when they have been our most kind mother, then who have been so kind, who have nourished me with the kindness from the human side, you know, who have been extremely cherishing, loving, affectionate, caring, whenever they have been our most kind mothers in each of those times. So remembering or recollecting kindness of the old mother sentient beings. And if we try to reflect on them, you know, then we can reflect, you know, how they sacrifice their own happiness and they are willing to take on hardship, difficulty for the for the child. You know, normally we as human beings we don't want any hardship. You know, we don't want any hardship. We try to avoid any kind of hardship. You know, and we like to have the happiness all the time. We don't want to sacrifice. We want to have happiness all the time. But the mothers, when they have child, and when the most kind mothers, they give up all of that. They, they, they are willing to sacrifice their own well-being, their own happiness for the child. They are willing to go through all the different hardship that they will need to go through in order to um, care, in order to bring the child. And, and that we see not only among human beings, we see that also in animals, how much hardship the parents, especially the mothers. You observe the birds, you observe the dogs, you observe all kinds of animals, and you can see, you know, they put through so a lot of hardship in order to uh, upbring the child, you know, until they are on their own feet, you know. Um, and for the child, they are willing to create a lot of negative karma. They are willing to fight with others, create a lot of enemies. And sometimes they are willing to um, you know, fight with their own close friends, families in order to protect the child. You know, and again, we see also in our, our own cases, you know, even in humans, you know, sometimes the mother fight with the fathers. Sometimes the mother fight with others, relative, in order to protect the child for their well-being. You know, um, and even in animal, you see that, you know, sometimes the mothers fighting with um, even the fathers when they feel that the father might be harming the child, you know, or other siblings uh, or other things um, or other species, you know, so that is how much um, the love, the kindness, the affections, um, the mothers has for the child, you know, and not only taking all the hardship while they are in mother's womb for nine months, but after birth, you know, and taking care until the child is able to take care of themselves. So reflecting on that, you know, sometimes we have forgotten all of those things. You know, we have forgotten the, all of that. And so the meditations is to help to, to recollect, to help to recollect all the sacrifice, all the hap you know, all, everything they did for us, especially when we we're most vulnerable and when we we're young. You know, uh, and that they have done that not just one time, countless times in a, all different uh, uh, realms in a different life form. You know, so, so 
then yeah, meditating on the kindness of the mother sentient beings, you know, and then meditating on the wish to repair the kindness. Once you once um, you feel the kindness, then you know the wish to repair the kindness will come and we try to build up that the wish to repair the, the kindness, you know. And the wish, the way to repair the kindness is to help them to to support and help them to free from their sufferings and cause of the sufferings and to um, to support and to help them to achieve happiness and cause of happiness. And so to, then we meditate on, you know, um, compassion and loving kindness, you know, by understanding, even though they do not wish suffering, but they continue to experience suffering. They continue to, and so again, reflecting on their own problem, their own pain, their own sufferings, you know, once we reflect contemplating that, feeling their pain, their suffering, as it is our own pain and suffering, and cultivating the strong wish to relieve them of all this suffering and cause of suffering, you know, so that is the compassion. And then again, you know, even though they all want happiness, true happiness, lasting happiness, but again, they all struggle to find that true happiness and cause of happiness. Again, reflecting, contemplating on that, feeling that, and then again, cultivating a strong wish to support and help them to achieve that true happiness and cause of happiness. And through that, cultivating the loving kindness. So then we meditate on loving kindness and compassion, you know. And then, not only we we wish to free them from suffering, cause of and lead them to happiness, cause of happiness, but taking the responsibility for ourselves, you know, they have been so kind and they have taken the responsibility for us so many times, endless time. And this is one opportunity for us to repay kindness to do that. You know, especially now when we have this human life, when we understand that. If we are born as an animal, it will be very hard to understand and to be able to repay the kindness and in other realms. But in this human life, through the um, teachings through the kindness of our teachers and teachings, at least we have some understanding how all of them have been so kind, compassion, caring so many times. And now they need our help, support, and, and this is the time to really do something, repair the kindness and do something, pay them, that, pay them back, you know. And when we get one opportunity, and if we don't do that, then you know we might never be able to pay them their kindness back. And you know, it is as such not only from Dharma point of view, even from ordinary point of view, you know, um, it is kind of not correct when someone has been so kind and helped you so many times, so many times, and when they need your help and you are not willing to or you are not doing, willing to help them one time, you know. And so through that kind of understanding, then you will try to generate a, you know, a special attitude or, you know, special attitude or uh, universal responsibility, you know, the wish to free them from suffering and cause, lead them to the cause of happiness by yourself, by yourself and yourself alone. You know, so cultivating that strong, powerful um, courage, courageous attitude of very courageous and uh, strong courageous and um, attitude of the um, special attitude, the wish, the, the, the wish to do to free them from suffering and bring them to happiness by yourself alone. 
So okay. once we meditate and once we have that special attitude, once we have developed that special attitude, then, you know, when we reflect on our, in reality, even though we have that kind of strong, powerful wish and courage to wish, but in reality, are we able to do that now? Can we do that? And then when you, when you reflect on our, because our own situation, our own capacity, our own ability, then we find being unenlightened ourselves, being confused ourselves, you know, being deluded ourselves, is extremely hard to help them to overcome their delusions, the root of their own problem and suffering. It's very hard to help them to uh, overcome their confusions, the root of their sufferings, you know. So as much as you want to help, but you know, it's like you don't have the skills, you don't have the capacity to be able to help at this point, in this moment, you know. And then we reflect, is it possible that you can actually is there any possibility that they can, you can reach a point where you can be free from all confusion yourself, from all the delusion, all the obscurations yourself, so that you can help them with your own direct experience to free them from all the confusion, all the delusion, all the obscurations, and the root of all the suffering and the suffering themselves. And, and then we understand, we see, in, oh, if only we can achieve enlightenment. If we can achieve fully enlightenment, if we can achieve fully enlightenment, then we can be free of all delusion, all the confusion, all the obscurations, and we will be able to develop all the inner positive qualities, you know, and limitless, unconditional love, compassion, the wisdom to be to see exactly uh, things as they are and individual needs and how to help, you know, according to their needs in it, right? And then when you understand, you know, if you can achieve that enlightenment, then you can do that. You can help them in that way. And then when you understand that, then you cultivate a wish to achieve that enlightenment so that you can, so that you can, uh, you know, fulfill the all the needs and well-being all sentient beings so that you can free all sentient beings from their suffering cause of suffering so that you can help and support them to achieve their ultimate happiness of enlightenment and so then once you have that wish to achieve that enlightenment for that purpose that is the, the bolshita mind that is the uh, uh, bolshita or awakening mind you know and so mm, And at the very beginning, the Bodhicitta mind, of course, we cultivate, you know, through effort. We try to meditate and then sudden, when you meditate, we might feel a little bit, you know, we really feel like, but then when we don't meditate, we don't feel that way, you know. But you keep on continuing meditating. And slowly, slowly, you know, you become more and more familiar with that practice you become more and more close to that practice all the time. And then even when you are not meditating, you, you will start to feel about that. You know, even when you are not meditating consciously, you will feel that. And so then, you know, then you will slowly, then you will be able to cultivate that mind effortlessly all the time. And when you have cultivated effortlessly all the time. That is when we cultivate the Bodhicitta mind and that is when one enter the, one become the Bodhisattvas and one enter the, the path of the Bodhisattvas or Mayana path, you know. Um, so, so that is, uh, so uh, who have nourished me to kindness from the beginning less time and now are tortured by ensnare within one extreme or others, either on the wheel of suffering or in tranquil liberation. So, you know, some of the sentient beings are experiencing the sufferings uh, or torture 
by the sufferings of the shame of samsara. You know, once you are in samsara, then you are always suffering. You know, um, one of those suffering. Sometimes the suffering of pain, sometimes suffering of change, or all the time the suffering of uh, all pervasive all the time. But some sentient beings or who are not bodhi, uh, bodhisattva, such as, you know, arhat. Arhat, even though they don't have the one extreme, the suffering of the samsara, but still they are in a tranquil liberation. They have individual liberation because that individual liberations, they have not achieved fully enlightenment because they have not overcome all the obscurations. And so they are in one extreme, you know. So those, for those bodhisattvas, I mean, for those arhat, then, you know, uh, is to the wish to free them from their subtle obscuration and the, the wish to lead them to fully enlightenment. So that is, that is true extreme, the extreme of either the will of suffering in the samsara or the tranquil liberations, you know, um, because after they don't have the suffering because they are free from the samsara, but still they are in one extreme. Of tranquil liberation. So, so, and once you have cultivated that bodhicitta mind, once you have cultivated that bodhicitta mind, you know, then trying to bring that bodhicitta mind into the practice, you know, that attitude into the action through the practice of generosity, moral discipline, patience, and all other um, bodhisattva contact, you know, all other bodhisattva contact. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so that is the, the kind of um, yeah, meaning of that uh, meditation on that, that verse. And next one is, you know, um, meditating on the, Within the six perfections, you know, uh, the Bosa practice there are six perfections, and especially the last two perfections, the perfection of karma abiding and special insight. And so the next one is training on that, meditating on that, you know, um, the yoga or the practice of uh, the combining or union of karma abiding or shamatha with a special insight, you know, the wisdom. Okay, so that is where. So bestow on me your blessing to generate the yoga. So yoga means practice. Combining mental uh, consistence, so that is karma abiding, you know, um, material concentration or shamatha, with the penetrating insight and the penetrating insight, the special insight, the penetrating insight, the wisdom, you know, um, that will that realize the emptiness, you know in which the hundred thousand full splendor of voidness, so emptiness, the voidness or emptiness, you know, the wisdom realizing the emptiness, you know, with so many different, you know, reasoning and logics, you know, hundred and thousand reasoning logic. The more reasoning logic you have, the more stronger realization you have of the emptiness. It's like, you know, in everything, when, you, when there is more evidence, the more proof, the more evidence, the more convinced you are. Do you get it? Like in everything. If you have only one proof, one evidence, maybe still you, you think you, your, your convictions might not be as, as strong. When that one, um, um, you know, evidence or proof, there's more, more proof, more evidence, the more convinced you have on that particular issue. And if there's hundreds of proof, hundreds and thousands of proof and um, evidence, then without any doubt, you know, your mind without being too minded, your convictions of that particular things will be very strong. Same way, that is why, that is why we try to use so many different reasons and logics. 
That's why there is so many Nagarjuna and others, they come with so many reason and logic. Some otherwise you can just use one reason and logic why we need all of that, why complicate things, you know. Why not make it simple? Just one reason and logic. But the way our mind works, the way our mind works is just one reason and logic. You can have some conviction, but your conviction is not strong enough. Our mind says, yes, but maybe, 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 you know, maybe we always think, but, but, or maybe, you know, all, all these things. And so when there is, when you have so many evidence, so many reason and logic, then, then it start, after some time, there's no maybe, or there's um, all uh, the feeling of maybe, or all of this, but in all of that, but you are hundred percent convictions. You have, your convictions is very strong. No doubt, too, not too minded. And so that is why, that is why studying all of those different reasons and logic can be very helpful and beneficial. The more, it's kind of more proof, more uh, evidence to prove that about the emptiness. So, mm -hmm. forever free from the both streams, you know. Um, and so, the emptiness that's free from the both stream, uh, the emptiness that is the middle way, you know, and the true extreme, the true ex free from true extreme, the extreme of nihilism, the extreme of internet, uh, inter, what do you call it? Internal, internal, not internal. Um, eternal. In, eternal. Internal. Eternal. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, eternal, meaning forever. Uh huh. Yeah, that one. Internalism. Internalism. Okay. Nihilism. Internalism. You know. So nihilism is thinking that nothing exists, or the object doesn't exist. Internalism is where you think that they exist inherently. You know. If it, and as John said, forever. If it exists inherently, then it will be existing forever. It becomes status, permanent. You know, and so and so free from that, you know, free from that. Um, and then once we have that convictions, you know, free from through that kind of analysis, meditations, you know, um, contemplation by using many different reasons and logics, you know, and then once you come to that conclusion, that understanding, uh, convictions that things are empty of inherent existing, you know, that all are completely empty of inherent existence. You know, they have been empty of inherent existence from the beginning's lifetime. They are empty of inherent existence now. They will be ever empty of inherent existence. It has always been inherently existing, uh, empty of inherent existence, never existed inherently at all, and never will exist inherently. You know, so through that kind of reflection, contemplation, then reflect without off, without so reflect, contemplate without abstraction in the clear mirror of immediate meditations. You know, so without any abstraction, without any doubt, and without any distractions, and with a clear mind, you try to meditate and you try to rest in that. You know, so that is. Um, that is uh, meditations um, on karma abiding and special insight or penetrating insight. You know, um, because uh, as uh, as Lam Thong Kappa said in his three principle expert of the path, you know. Even you generate a pure renunciations and bullshit the mind, if you do not cultivate the wisdom realizing emptiness, the penetrating inside the wisdom realizing emptiness, you will not be able to cut the root of samsara. And if you cannot cut the very root of samsara, then you cannot achieve full enlightenment. 
And so therefore, in order to cut the root of samsara, the root of samsara and the suffering in samsara is um, our own karma, contaminated karma. And the karma is rooted in our delusions. The karma is created because of our delusions. And the delusions are rooted in the fundamental ignorance. The fundamental ignorance of grasping the self and the phenomena to exist inherently. And in order to destroy and cut the root of that fundamental ignorance that mistakenly grasps the self and phenomena to exist inherently in order to store that, then we need to have the wisdom that relies the self and all phenomena do not exist inherently. And so we need to cultivate, we need to develop that wisdom, penetrating wisdom or insight in order to destroy the very root of all the delusions, the fundamental ignore. And in order to be able to actualize penetrating insight, the wisdom, then first we need to cultivate um, the special insight. I mean, um, Kama abiding, meditating concentrations, or shamada, come abiding, and so that. And not only we need to develop both of them, then we need to practice those two practices in union, each of them supporting each other. Mm -hmm. mm. For example, they give you examples, you know. Um, In the darkness, you know, if you if you are trying to find something, let's say maybe there is an image of something on the wall, and then you, you want to see the image clearly, you know, and then you have they use the old um, examples, of course, like butter lamp, you know, or candle to 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 have lights so you can see the pic the um, painting, the pictures, whatever. In order to see it very clearly, there need to be two things. One, you know, that there's no wind, there must movement. If there is too wind, then again, you cannot see clearly. You know, if there's too much movement, because the wind blowing, and so on your candle light, then you cannot see clearly. So you need to have a condition when there is no too much wind, that, that kind of movement. So that is come abiding, meditative concentrations. You need strong meditative concentrations, you know. And then not only you need that, you need a very, you know, very powerful, strong, light if if the butter uh, if the uh, candle is very small if the light is small you might not be able to see the whole things and clearly but you need what you need is very strong that and so that is so not you need the, uh, then you, for that then you need that, that kind of strong penetrating inside of the wisdom and then together with that the strong light of penetrating wisdom supported by, you know, unmoving, free from the movements, the wind of distractions and so forth, then you can see clearly. And so that, that way we can see the clear reality of the self and phenomena. Then one will be able to see clearly, you know, the reality of the self and the phenomena. And that will mm, act as the antidote to destroy and cut the very root of all the delusion and the delusion that arises from those, uh, that fundamental ignorance. Mm. <clears throat> so, so that is, um, so that is the meditation on that, that verse is 
in meditation on the karma abiding and penetrating wisdom, emptiness. And next one up to that, then you know it is the, the path of the the path of the sutra, you know. And then next one, you know, once you have that foundations, the foundation of that sutra path. Once you have the strong foundation on sutra path, then one enter the tantric path, Vajrayana path, you know. And so again, again, when we when we study, you in all the studies you find where there is a you know um, Adisha's uh, lamb of the path to enlightenment. You know, whether we study Lamson Kavas, you know, Great Lambrim, Middle Lambrim, Short Lambrim, or others, you know, foundation of all qualities, you know, or here, His Holiness writing on here, they all started with the, the foundational practice of Sutrayana. You know, whether we call it, there are two ways, two different ways of presenting it, one can be presented from the path of three principles, except path, renunciation, bodhicitta mind and wisdom, wisdom realizing emptiness, or it can be presented from the um, point view of um, three scope, the practice of small scope, middle scope and great scope. But basically it's the renunciation and Bodhisattva and wisdom realizing emptiness. Those need to have, we need to have that strong foundation so that when you enter the tantric path, the tantric path, the practice of tantric path become profound and effective. Without good foundation, then you will not um, have the tantric practice, doesn't become as profound as it should be. It doesn't become as effective and helpful as it should be because of not having a strong foundations. And that is why they all present, they never present the tantric path first. They all present the, the foundational practice first. And, and you have to go through each of those practices. Um, and that is why sometimes we feel why, you know, we try to do Vajrayana practice, Tantra practice, but seems like we are not having the result as it should be having. You know, whatever different Tantra practice we do, and the reason is because the practice, we are unable to get as result, as strong result, because we don't have the strong foundations, strong foundations of those Three principle aspect of that, you know, um, because we don't pay too much attention that, you know, um, and as we, it will come, you know, most all the tantric practice, you know, whether it's high yoga tantra or whether it's a you know, Lord Tantra, when we do any kind of sadhana and bar practice, you know, there's always, you know, and if you are visualizing your deity or, or even in front generation, you know, they dissolve, everything dissolves into emptiness and from emptiness, then it arises um, as a deity, as a mandala, whether it's a set generation or whether it's a front generation, you know, in Lord so if we don't have a good realization of emptiness, then we are just only be imagining from emptiness is arising. It's not really your wisdom realizing the emptiness arising in that form. Do you get it? Because we don't have the wisdom realizing emptiness to actually manifest into that form daily. So we are only just imagining but if we have the realization of emptiness, then your realization, wisdom realizing emptiness is then manifesting in that form. And when you manifest your wisdom realizing emptiness into that particular deity's form, 
then you don't have any grasp into the, that daddy, you know, the mandala, whether it's from generation or whether it's set generations. Because of that, your understanding of emptiness, even when you visualize that, you don't have any clinging grasping to that. At the moment, you know, when you visualize your daddy, you still have clinging to that body. You visualize an Avalogi Shota, but you still have grasping to that Avalogi Shota form. You visualize whether yourself or front generations as daddy, we still have grasping to that thinking, oh, it's inherently existing daddy. Front or inherently existing yourself as Avalogi Shota. So still we are unable to so still there's a grasping, you know? And so therefore, we are unable to have, you know, um, so then even when we visualize them, then that doesn't become as effective when set generation or front generations that is supposed to help us to reduce our delusions, to overcome the, uh, grasping or in, uh, impure and the grasping, and we are unable to destroy that because, and so, but once we have realization emptiness, then from that wisdom realizing emptiness, then you visualize manifesting in that form, and then there is no more grasping. And then you practice whatever sadhana, whatever practice you do in tantric practice, then they become very powerful, very effective and profound as they should be, you know? And so I think that is very important for us to understand and focus on the foundation first. You know, sometimes we'd like to, sometimes we, we have tendency to kind of trying to grab the, the best one, you know, without focusing on the foundations. And so, um, yeah. Mm. So, so, so next, once you have that good foundations of three principal aspect of path, or or the lumbering path, um, the, the sutra lumbering path, or three practice or three scope. Once you have that good foundations, then next in, entering the tantric was in a path. And so, so that is why now the extra. Um, bestow on me your blessing to observe in the strict accordance all the vows and words of honor that form the root of powerful attainments. Hmm? Having entered through the gate of extremely profound tantra by the kindness of my all provisions masters. So <clears throat> the path of Tantra is extremely profound. If practice in Tantra is very profound, if we have that good foundations. If you don't have good foundation, then they do not become as profound, you know. If you don't have good foundations, a lot of Tantra practice are very common with the, even the some other non-Buddhist practice as well, you know. There are a lot of practice, similar practice, common practice within the Hindu and Buddhism when it comes to Tantra. Many of the technique of, you know, working with your opening with energies, you know, all those things, you know, they are very common. What makes unique and different from their practice is the bodhicitta mind and the wisdom and relaxing emptiness. When you bring those two things in that practice, then it becomes unique and Buddhist practice. You know, the bodhicitta and wisdom relaxing emptiness. You know, when you bring those factors into your tantric practice, then that becomes Buddhist tantric practice. Otherwise, just doing the exercise of levitating because walking with your wind energy to levitate 
or working with your wind uh, energy to give you, you know, um, heat to produce heat, or visualizing yourself as a particular deity with a single point of concentrations, or even opening up the doors of the chakras through different wind uh, method. Those are common practice. They are common. And what makes it unique is those factors, you know. And so therefore, um, and when you have those factors, then it becomes profound. Then it is profound. You know, there, there is a lot of technique that you don't find in Sutta, where you find in Kanta, um, that you can use in your meditations uh, and make your meditation even more powerful, you know. And so in order to practice the Tantra, we have to, um, to enter the uh, Tantra, then we need to receive the initiations. You know, the gateway to enter the Tantric path is the initiations, you know. It's like the gateway, the gateway to enter the path of Tantra is initiations. The gate is, the gateway is the initiation. The initiation is the one that give you the blessings, you know, that is kind of unbroken blessings from the masters until now, unbroken um, lineage and the blessings that can continue, you know, through practice from one master to another master through their practice. And it is a blessings and also it is a kind of being the permissions the permissions or empowering you to practice. He says, that is why sometimes it is called empowerment, initiation or empowerment. It is initiating or empowering you to study and learn and practice of that particular tantra. So one need to achieve. And in order to have initiation, then one should receive from a qualified masters, okay? qualified masters, authentic qualified masters. <clears throat> and once we have received the initiations <clears throat> from authentic qualified masters, the next is keeping the vows. When you take the initiations, then there are commitments, there are the vows, the words of honor, like the commitments, you know, the vows, whatever commitments, that is given and whatever commitment you have taken, you know, whatever vows you have taken in relation to receiving the, um, the initiations, then keeping them is the... Um, mm, so that is why observe in strict according all the vows and word and honor form or root of powerful attainments. And so that those vows and commitments are the very root of powerful attainments of your practice. The more supreme attainment is full enlightenment. And then there are many others attainments while before you achieve enlightenment, you can have eight common kind of, you know, eight common attainments that can help support you to practice the Dharma. And, further, and that can be a, a tools to benefit and help sentient beings. So there are kind of eight common um, attainments and supreme attainments, the supreme attainment, the fully enlightenment. And so in order to achieve those common and supreme attainment, the root of that is keeping those vows, commitments. So that's why it says, so this very important um, part of that, you know, um, Mm. And in in a in a lower tantra, once you have been initiated uh, or received the initiation and empowerment, then the one of the root is to keep vows and commitments, as it mentioned here, 
And on the basis of keeping those vows or observing those vows and commitment, you know, strictly pure. While you do that, then of course, then engage in the path. You know, in, in the lower tantra, then there is um, two main practice, the practice with a sign and practice without sign or signless. Those are, and in high sri of tantra, then there are two main practice, the practice of, you know, um, generation stage and completion stage. Again, just like uh, the sutra path, there's a gradual stages of the path, also in tantra, there's a stages of the path. You know, first you train in the, um, in, in terms of high yoga tantra, first you train into the path of generation, the path, uh, the practice of, um, you know, generation path. And then once you are perfected in that generation path, once you have a strong foundation of that, and once you are perfecting that, then, then you do the completion stage, the practice of completion stage. And that is the highest level of the tantric practice. And that is the highest level of practice in the whole path, you know. But in order to engage in that, you need to have the earlier practice, strong foundations of earlier practice. Without strong foundation or earlier practice, then, you know, even you engage in those practice, it will not become effect, uh, profound or effectful, or, uh, as you cannot uh, achieve much result from that because of due to lack of, lack of strong foundations, earlier foundations. So, so, and then you know there are uh, within the completion stage, uh, you know there are many generations, you know. Um, the body isolations, uh, the uh, you know, speech isolation, the mind as um, yeah, uh, and and um, and then you know um, immortal um, clear light, you know. Um, ultimate clear light, you know, so again, within that path, then again, there are stages that you move from one stage to another stages, you know, and the, the point of that is, you know, as we progress in our path, you know, step by step, first starting with the Sutta path, the common path, and then once you enter the, um, um, tantric path, you know, again, com starting with the um, genesis stage and completion stage, and within that completion um, those four different stages, and then at the end is to transform our, you know, wind energy, you know, especially the more subtle wind energy in the form of you know, Rubakaya and to transform um, our more subtle mind, clear light mind, into the form of Dharmakaya. You know, and so that through those different practice, that's where you uh, you do. You know, so therefore that's why it's saying, bestow many of blessings we attain within this lifetime, the blissful Ma Mudra of union of body and wisdom. You know, so to be able to achieve the union of illusory body, you know, not a kind of physical body like ours, contaminated physical body, but an illusory body, you know, through the most subtle um, wind energy. And the, the Dhammakaya wisdom, you know, that, um, that is the, our most subtle mind, the clear light mind, um, you know, um, generating and transforming in the Dhammakaya wisdom through severing completely by my all creating karmic energy um, with a wisdom sharp sort of non duality of bliss and emptiness. 
you know, so to, by cultivating that wisdom, you know, um, clear light mind, the wisdom mahamudra, or clear light mind of that, um, the wisdom of that clear light mind, you know, um, that comes after the, you know, the four emptiness and for blissfulness. Uh, again, there is a, a method in tantric practice, you know. Um, so I don't think we need to, then you develop, you cultivate that and then that, that, has, that transform into, a, and then you achieve the two kayas, Rupa Kaya and Dharma Kaya simultaneously when you achieve enlightenment. Um, and so, Yeah. So I think, um, so I think that is, I think that is more or less. And then here there is a, having made requests in this way for the development in your mindset stream of entire path of Prasutta and Tanda, and thus, having done a glance meditation on them, now recite six syllable mantras with Oman Vemehun in connection with merging of spiritual master into your heart. So I think probably we'll do that next uh, next week, but up to here, we, we discussed that. So, so we try to do the glance meditation. Glance meditation is you just go through each point quickly. You just go through that, um, you know, because we don't have time to do all of them in the depth. Um, so, and by doing that client meditation, at least we are aware of each steps, each one by one. And when we have time, then we can do more extensive meditation on each of those points, you know. Um, And sometimes, you know, if you have a time and if you want to focus on one of the meditation while you do that, you know, then for a month, you can just focus on your devotions, um, you know, with the more details and all the rest of them, you can just do glance meditations. And then for next month, you can focus on precious human rebirth and then all others you can do just clients. And then the next month, for a one month, you can uh, do more um, extensive meditations on the dead impermanent and all others on client meditation. So that way you, you could focus on one particular subject for each month and the rest of them you can do clients in that. And, and so, but in order to really have a, transformations, you know, in our mind, you know, then we need to do more deeper meditations, more extensive deeper meditation, not just the blind meditations, you know. Um, okay. Um, so in that way, then with that glance, at least you do short meditation, the whole path, whole, both here, both here, Sutta and Tantra. So before we go to more on that, I think um, any any questions from so far? Does anyone has any questions? Anything to share? Anything to discuss? So again, if you have, then uh, um, again, um, you can feel free to do that. But again, with each of those words, they start with, please bless this and this, you know. Um, 
Um, when we are doing a glance meditation, we might not have time to do each of those visualizations, but while you do the glance meditation of, of whole path, but as I mentioned, we might be focusing on one particular subject each day. You know, you might want to do particular um, and more extensive meditations on one particular subject, whether you want to do keep that same subject for a week or months or even more than months. Um, and before we do the, the actual meditations, extensive meditation, whatever subjects, you visualize, and I, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this lumbar meditation, you know, you visualize, first you make the request to the, you know, um, Buddha of Lokbishoda, to guide us, to bless us, to inspire us to cultivate all these realizations, the whole path, you know. And then you visualize um, after your request, then your request is granted uh, delightfully. And then, you know, white light and nectar flow from the heart of Buddha Avalokiteshvara and the, the, the um, guidance of mantra and enter yourself cleansing and purifying all the sickness, all the delusions, all the karma, all the negative karma, all the delusions and all the obscuration and special and all the obscurations to have the, the, the realization of the whole path, both Tantra and Sutta, both Sutta and Tantra whole path. And especially whatever you are trying to meditate that, you know, if you are trying to meditate in Guru devotions, in that sense, then you visualize, especially all the obscurations to have a realization of Guru devotion have been completely cleansed and purified. So you emphasize on that, especially that if you are meditating on, um, if you are meditating on precious human life, then you, you think, especially all the obscurations to have a realization of precious human life has been completely cleansed and purified. And you change if you are meditating extensive on that impermanent, then especially the uh, the obscurations or obstacles to have the realizations of the dead impermanent and totally cleansed and purified. And so, you, whatever main subject of meditation you do, you try to do that. And once everything has been cleansed and purified, then you can again visualize more light nectar flowing from the heart and the Guidance of the mantra in the form of yellow orange light and entering yourself, feeling your whole body from the down to the up, you know, and receiving all the blessings of enlightened body, speech, and mind, and all the realizations of the whole path, and especially whatever meditation you are doing. And then, if you are doing Guru devotion, then you visualize especially receiving the blessing of realization of Guru devotions. If you are doing meditation on, uh, you know, um, precious human life, then you visualize, especially receiving the blessing of realization of precious human rebirth. If you are doing meditation on dead impermanence, especially receiving the blessing of realization of uh, dead impermanence. If you are doing meditation on um, theory, uh, you know, refuge, then you visualize, especially receiving the realization of refuge or renunciations, the bodhicitta, wisdom. So whatever you are focusing on, then you visualize um, receiving that particular, all the realizations in general, whole path, but especially that particular, whatever you are focusing on. So we start with that. And once you have done that, then you started to actually go in more depth and detailed meditations, contemplation, whatever you do, okay? So, and so that is how we bring uh, those visualizations and whatever meditation we do, you know, whether we are doing Kama writings or whether we do an you know, placement meditation or whether we do any kind of analytical meditation is really good to start with that, you know, start with that. Um, so then, um, Yes, thank you, Isla. Right now, I can't imagine progressing on the path. 
so much in the learn. Um, so, hmm? yeah. So that is any 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 others. From what we discussed, of maybe also from previous. Um, hi, Geshela. Thank you so hi. much. I don't really have a question. It's more, um, I just wanted to say thank you. I really liked how you started the session today talking about the kindness of our mothers and. Um, I just really liked hearing you talk about that today and just wanted to say thank you. Um, it just gave me uh, a lot to reflect on tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I think we all have a lot to reflect on, you know. Of course, the reflections to towards all sentient beings, you know. But for us, even just to be able to reflect on our own mother of this life, it is still it requires a lot, you know, um, because sometimes we are not aware or we are forgotten, you know, um, how much they did for us. You know, um, especially when we were young, when we were incapable of any things, when we were most vulnerable, no, um, they were all totally dead for us. Unfortunately, our memory is short term, so we have forgotten all of that. You know, that is the one problem with the. Uh, short-term memories, you know. Um, the bad side is, even though we have short-term memory in general, the bad things that happen, we don't forget them. You know, if we have argument with them, probably we have not forgotten them, you know. If they have, if they have said something hurtful, intentionally, unintentionally, or in a moment, or they did something that was hurtful, probably we have not forgotten all of that. You know, we still remember them. But I think rest, how much they have done, probably we have forgotten most of them. We only sometimes remember very little. Um, so, and that is the purpose of meditations, you know, if we don't meditate, of course, when we talk about discuss it, I think we more or less, we all kind of understand that and agree that, you know, we can't, we, I don't think we have any kind of resistance or thinking that is not the true or opposite of that in general. I think we kind of understand that we kind of that, but we don't feel that every day. We don't feel that every day because, you know, it's not in our, it's behind our mind, it's not in mind all the time. And the meditation is to help us to bring that all the time so that we can be aware of that all the time. And if we are aware of that all the time, the way we respond to them, the way we interact will be different different, you know, um, the way you do with them by that awareness, with that understanding would be different than someone who interact without that awareness, without remembering that, you know, uh, because we all, you know, are much more patient. We all are much more caring, loving, kind to our parent or anyone when we are aware that they are kind to us, you know, 
when we are aware, when in the moment, when we are, when we are aware, they have been kind to us, they have been precious to us, all of that. But then when we are not in that state, when we are not aware of that, we forget that we are not aware and then we can be a little bit nasty, you know, not so kind and all of that. So that is how, uh, you know, um, sometimes because sometimes people think, you know, well, I have, I understood that. So why should I meditate? You know, do you get it? I understand that. I understood. So if I don't understand, maybe I need to meditate to be, uh, to understand, but now I have understanding that I'm out of that. So why I need to meditate every day, you know? Well, even we have understanding, but since that is not uh, spontaneous at the moment, it is, uh, so it's not there all the time. And so uh, the meditation to help us to reach a point where it becomes spontaneous and effortless and where we have awareness or that feeling all the time. And if we have that all the time, then definitely our approach, our interactions, are, it would be different and much more healthier and better and positive for everyone. Yeah. Yes, John? Um, I'm not sure how to frame this correctly, Geshla, but for someone that doesn't uh, know very much at all about Tantra. Firstly, this is a pretty dumb question, but is this a tantric practice? This mm -hmm. And when do you know, I mean, when to, it seems like, you know, there's the safe path as way that I visualize it as the sutra path. And then there's this exotic, esoteric, you know, slightly intimidating um, tantric path with all, which, you know, for me, I've, I've always, and through your teachings, Yeshla, you've made it pretty clear that um, you need a really, to get a very strong basis before you, uh, let me say, wander off into the esoteric tantric world. Uh, when, when do you know when you should be entering the, the, this, this, this path. I don't know if I've explained yeah. that. But... Well, you know it when I say it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, I was happy you were to say something. Yeah. Like that. Uh, uh... There is two different approach, okay? There's two different approach among practitioners, also among the masters, um, their instructions, their advice, you know. Um, one approach is to go step by step. You have this, this realization and then you move to the next practice. You have the realization of that and then you move to that. And that's the stage of the path, you know. Mm. Then there is another approach, you know, um, with many masters, many teachers, advice. And since it might take many lifetimes even to have realization of the first path, you know, we might never get opportunity to practice the higher path, hundred path, or that in this path, in this life, if we wait. Or even in terms of, if we are, even in terms of sutra path, if you just focus on the calm abiding, maybe for some people, it might take many times to develop calm abiding. And then you will never have access to the emptiness path, meditation on that. And so therefore, is a wise that you have studied all of them, you have some realization, or you have some practice all of them, and you have practice, you have at least kind of good understanding each of them, and not only just intellectual understanding, you have work on that, even if you don't have a realization, you have work on all of that, and you have the whole idea of whole path, you have study, 
practice the whole bed, even we haven't had any realization so far, then it's a good to have the imprint of the tantra because so that we can, you know, even we cannot, even we don't focus on tantra at this point, even we will focus on the, the foundation sutra path, but at least it's a good to have the imprint of the tantras. And therefore, it's good to receive the initiations and do little practice, but the focus should be on foundations until you reach there. But at least to have those, at least to have some imprint so that when we feel ready for that, then we have the, in, uh, then we have ready, when you, if, if you make a progress, then when you are ready to enter the hunter path, you have all the initiation, everything, you can just jump into it. And then you don't have to find, oh, another teacher, where is that? Is there any teacher who will give you this or that? And we might not be able to find it and that, that is one thing. And even in next life, maybe we might not have connection and imprint to receive the hundred teachings and practice. When, even when you are ready, maybe you might not be able to receive because you don't have the connections, not create the karma, didn't have the imprint. For that purpose, then it's better to kind of do that, you know? And so that is one thing I think to have. So, okay. So like, for example, you know, a lot of practitioners sometimes, they might focus on the, the high sugar tantra because they want to walk on their lumb rim, the sutra path, but still they have taken those initiations. So to have an imprint and that, and they might still practice a little bit, but their focus will be the foundations, you know. Um, even like many of the uh, monks and also lay practitioners who are doing a lifetime retreat in Dharamsala, you know, another guidance of his holiness, you know, and, and many of them have taken a lot of high yoga tantra and they have a lot of commitments and all of that, you know, but the, his holiness advice is many, for many of them, you know, he even gave a permission, not they don't need to do the, all the satanas, just for both the long rim, you know. You know. Uh, um, and because so you do take those uh, initiations um, for that purpose, but you still uh, focus on the foundation in terms of the practice, you know. And is this part of the tantric practice? Yes, it is part of tantric practice. You know, it is not high, uh, it is part of tantric practice. Um, but again, it's not so focused on tantric practice. You know, it's a, com it's a, it is a, a combined practice of both sutra and tantra, you know. And even though it's part of tantra, even there's a mentioning of tantra, uh, but it's not really, you know, um, so much focus on that, you know, the only, there are only a few part of, of that, you know, so, um, yeah, so, um, the so-called tantric exotic practice is that high yoga tantra and especially completion stages, that is where the exotics can come, you know, but, for us, you know, even we focus on Tantra, the focus is on generation stage, you know, not on the completion stage, you know. And generation stage is safe. You just, it's about visualizing the mandala, visualizing yourself and, you know, and transforming uh, the dead, the part of uh, the rebirth into, you know, um, Dhammakaya. Uh, some Boaka and Nirvana Kaya. So that is the main kind of that. So it is through those different visualizations and different focus. So I think there is nothing unsafe about those practices. Okay. The most danger unsafe is when people have not reached completion stage and still they try to do all this completion state practice, opening your chakras to different methods. That is where the uh, you can kind of disturb your um, channels because if you are not 
guided by good teachers, you, you could kind of mess up sometimes. And also some method, you, when you are not ready, you engage in a certain method. And then you, uh, that those, but I think, especially like when you do this um, low tantra, I don't think there is any kind of unsafe, you know, even in high yoga tantra generation stage, there's nothing that is kind of unsafe, anything like that. I think most time the, uh, the unsaid part is when it comes to completion and when someone is not ready and still they try to use some of the technique or some of the method to open their chakra through a different method, that is where they, there is the danger, you know, uh, and misuse and all of that, you know. Um, so that would be my advice. So, and yeah. Uh, thanks, Kishore. That's good. And Hen, did you have a question? I think I saw you. Oh, no, I don't. Krishna, thank you so much. I just, and yeah, I just listening, try to listening carefully. So, but okay. yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, yeah, you know, um, and even in, even in, even in my own personal case, and, you know, even though, I think I've taken a lot of high yoga tantra initiations. I think um, mostly because of not knowing it, it has become in, in Tibetan cultures, it has become so, so that, that even the children who, who doesn't know anything, they, they go to initiate, they, they, uh, they take it, you know? So, um, and because of that, you know, um, I have been kind of, it wasn't even, it, it, at, when we were young, we didn't even know anything about, but we just, a teacher came and then they were giving and without understanding, we took all of that and all of that, you know, and all of that. I've been more kind of careful later after I studied, learned, and once I have more understanding of that, you know, um, you know, yeah, I think many of my friends might think I'm too cautious. Um, even when his holiness is coming to Sera or close by and giving all this high yoga tanda, you know, a lot of time I didn't go, you know. Uh, everyone went and everyone, everyone went, you know, um, except for some of the young ones. And still I, uh, I didn't go, you know, many of them. Um, and, uh, but of course, um, also I've uh, taken uh, some of them, you know. Um, but again, you know, I can't do all of them, you know. I don't have time to do all of those sadhanas and, and, and uh, extensively each of them, you know. Um, so, but you focus on one particular that you feel connected or whatever, or one particular, and others you just do the commitments short, you know, whatever short sadhanas that your commitment is, you know, and of course you have a long commitment, of course you have to do that long commitment. If you don't have those long commitments, you can do the short one or just mantras depending on what commitment you have. And then you just try to focus on doing one particular, um, more extensive one particular, you know, if supposedly if someone has taken many of them, you know, but, um, but you know, um, sometime, you know, um, yeah, uh, we feel like we have to take everything, you know, that's not necessary. If you have once high yoga tantra, I think that would be good, you know, just to have the imprint, the connections, and just work on that, you know. Um, um, yeah, because, you know, each, every initiation have uh, their own unique benefit and uniqueness, and when they explain their uniqueness and benefit, and then you feel like you have to take it, you know. And then it seems like, if, if that's the case, then you feel like you have to take all the hardship, you know, this, oh, this is very rare, and this is, if you do this, this is very powerful, this and that. And everyone has their own uniqueness, everyone has their own, 
um, uh, you know, benefit and power, but um, personally, my perception had changed a little bit, uh, you know. Um, now I'm more, you know, what do I really want to focus? And if it's related with that, then I will, and if there's something, even if it's very, supposed to be very rare and extremely beneficial uh, with a lot of benefit, if I don't feel like I want to do that, I'm not ready to do that practice or if I don't feel connected or if I don't, uh, no matter who's giving or no matter whatever, you know, I don't feel like I need to go, you know, even if it's his holiness, even if it's my teachers who have all the connections, you know, strong connections, um, that is that is how, that's how I feel and that's my approach. But many of my friends approach not that, you know, so, as I said, you know, uh, and that is the beauty of the Dharma. That is how I feel. The beauty of Dharma is nothing is fixed. Different people have different approach. Even among the teachers, my, my, I have many teachers and they have different approach. You know, his students approach is different than Lama Sabarim was his approach. In many, many, in many, many areas, even in practice, you know, and among my other teachers, they have different approach. And so, you know, and so, whatever approach kind of suit you more, you know, you try to follow that, you know. Um, and we don't have to be so rigid because my teacher does that, I have to follow all that. You know, because even in my teachers, there's so many different approaches among all my different teachers. So I cannot follow everything because otherwise I will have contradiction in some way, you know, because they have different approach, you know. And um, and even in ritual, that is the way how it is like good under system, you may kind of call it system, very different in many rituals, you know. And so does that mean one is wrong? No, you know, both are right, but it's a different approach, you know. And, and if you don't know that, it seems like if you don't know both tradition, you might see if you know one tradition and when you see another monk practicing the other way, you think, oh, they are doing wrong, you know. Sometimes the mudra is different. Sometimes the, uh, uh, you know, um, so there are many, and so, so, so you might think, oh, he or she is doing wrong, but it's not wrong. It's just a different traditions. It's a different approach. It's a different lineage. It's a different traditions, you know, and, and um, I think being aware of that is very important for us so that we don't get so, fix everything so fixed and become too critical you know um with ourselves with others you know um so and don't have to feel guilt you know definitely i'm unable to follow all my teachers how they do things but i don't feel guilt about it because I'm still doing according to a certain approach of some of my other teachers, and they have different approach. And my mind is, is suits more with that particular teacher's approach than other. It doesn't mean that the other approach is wrong or not beneficial, but it's just my, my way of thinking or my way of things suits a particular approach of particular teachers than another particular teachers. And so, so I try to follow that approach more than the others, you know, instead of feeling startled where I don't feel connect, but still you feel like you have to do that because your teachers does that. But instead, you know, because still I'm following one particular teacher's approach, you know, I'm not going against any of teachers still is following one particular teacher's approach 
in the device, you know, so. So, yeah, so that is, um, yeah. So I think that I just wanted with that, share that uh, for some, it can be helpful, you know, just to have that understanding it can be helpful, beneficial for some, you know. Uh, okay, we do the dedications. Okay, today maybe we might chant in Tibetan because I think we haven't chanted in Tibetan for a long time. So you get used to the chanting, um, the tunes, uh, you know. Lama Sange Do Thank you very much, everyone. So good night for those who are on this side and good afternoon who are on the other side. Okay, in Australia. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Geshe. Thanks for